move away from in the past. Well, the man that we can ask all those questions to is the editor of the Racing Post, Tom Kerr, who joins me now. Tom, uh, a pretty exciting day for, for you tomorrow. We're all cautiously excited about the resumption of racing, but the Racing Post print edition is back. It is, yes. Back in the shops tomorrow for the first time since late March. Um, We've been preparing for the return of, of the Racing Post and the return of racing for the last few weeks and the team here have been uh, beavering away making sure we're all set to launch uh, or to relaunch rather and it's hugely exciting that the day has dawned. Uh, I can't wait till tomorrow till I can pick up a copy of the Racing Post and settle in for the racing from Newcastle. How close did you come to saying, well, you know, it's not financially viable to bring the, the print edition back? I think that was never really on the cards that we were, we were considering stopping the print edition. I think like a lot of businesses at the start of this, when we were contemplating no racing, no revenues, uh, we were in a challenging financial position and, and at that point it was really about you know where are we going to be in six months time if racing's not back if we're still in a lockdown situation you know clearly there was a there was a pretty uh, dark period for a lot of businesses um, as a consequence I think if you look back over the last two months and you think about what's been done by the government to support businesses and what's been done by racing in order to come back in a in a pretty timely fashion you know we can we can look and see tomorrow and, and say you know that's a good result um we've got racing back within uh, 11 weeks and we'll be able to launch the, the paper as well richard was talking there about how you might prioritize your your staff your reporters when they're going out onto the race course in the in the next few weeks uh, it's, it's going to be different, as he was saying, from, from what it was when we, when we closed racing. Are you starting afresh, if you like? Are you approaching this with a, a, a slightly different philosophy? I think our philosophy, uh, you know, I think what Richard said there was, was, a, was probably a little bit unfair because in the two weeks running up to the uh, cessation of racing, we probably had more reporters on course than every other media outlet uh, in the country combined. You know, we employ in the region of 30 racing reporters. That's just reporters, not production staff, not tipsters, analysts. Um, you know, again, that's probably more than any other uh, publication. If you take all the other uh, national newspapers and you combine them. So, you know, we have a huge investment in, in racing, uh, in, in covering racing. And we want to ensure that we provide our readers and the industry with the most comprehensive and relevant coverage we can. Now... If we could have someone on course at every single meeting, I would absolutely jump at that. Uh, what we normally do is we sort of prioritise, and, and I think we, we cover well north of 1,000 meetings a year. So, so again, more than anyone else. Um, obviously, with the racing relaunching, there's a huge excitement about the action that's coming up. And we're going to be on course uh, throughout the opening week, and we're going to look to cover as many meetings as we possibly can. I think it's really important that we cover the most important stories in racing and you know those come from everywhere we've got reporters embedded in newmarket we've got a reporter embedded in lambourne we've got a reporter embedded in paris we're actually one of the very few uh, newspapers in britain that still has a paris correspondent so you know we're out there every day trying to uncover the uh, the biggest stories and the most important stories for racing it, obviously, that there will be a, a premium on that because so few people will be able to attend. Is that going to alter the way your news pages look because you have access that is now sort of old school privileged, if you like, that perhaps you you didn't have in in the immediate preceding weeks before before lockdown? Yeah, to a degree. I mean, we've just had our editorial conference uh, half an hour ago, and you know, obviously, everyone speaking on hangouts and you know one of the messages which which we're putting across this week is that it's basically like a, a festival we're treating it almost like it's another Cheltenham because the interest in racing the interest in racing coming back after after such a long hiatus is going to be heightened so you know we're going to be giving some really comprehensive coverage of the of the action uh, from uh, first of all Newcastle tomorrow but then building through the week until we get this 
this incredible crescendo just in week one with the Guineas meeting. Um, so yeah, readers can expect some really comprehensive coverage packages. What, are, what can we look forward to? What, tease us with what, why we should go out and buy the, the print edition of The Post this week. OK, yeah, I mean, we've got a hell of a lot coming up. Even, even just tomorrow's edition is a bumper edition. It's probably one of the longest we'll ever put out. We've got uh, Alistair Down, uh, the inimitable Alistair Down, setting things up. And I've just, I've just finished reading his, his setup piece, and it's exactly what you'd expect from Alistair. It's, it's stirring, it's moving, it's funny. Um, and he's just a man I think you want to welcome back racing. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got an interview with Lester Piggott, who's, uh, as you know, is not, not, not one to give out interviews left, right and centre. Uh, we've got our Stable Tours series starting, and, and we're speaking to Richard Hannon for that uh, in tomorrow's edition. Uh, and then some other huge yards through the week. We've got um, Antipose Pricewise looking at the rescheduled classics. Uh, we've got an interview with Frankie de Tori coming up on Wednesday, um, and we're going to have you know all of all the the usual commentary, analysis, and tipping from our our, our team of experts. Uh, just in terms of, of distribution, there will be a lot of people this week who will want to go out and get hold of a copy of the print edition, who perhaps were relying exclusively on their online subscriptions beforehand. Are you confident that the distribution will meet those needs? Because quite often people now can't get hold of a racing post in their local newsagent. Yeah, we're going to be ensuring that we've got really good supply out tomorrow. We know that there's a lot of interest in the racing and we want to make sure everyone who can get hold of a newspaper can do. Um, you know, for those who unfortunately find that it's unavailable, we of course do have our digital edition, uh, which is available through our members club on racingpost.com so there's other ways of getting hold of it but really what I'd say to people is uh, if you're at all worried about not getting hold of it give your news agent a call today and make sure that they reserve a copy for you. Okay well you can't say, can't say, fair, can't say more than that. Um, just, just in terms of the, the pricing structure now clearly for, for the Racing Post business has been affected like everybody's business has been affected how, how much will that cost be, be placed onto the, the readers in the next in the next few months are there going to be significant price increases no not at all we're going to stick to the prices that we had beforehand um and we you know we never contemplated that at all we know that at, you know the racing post is a premium publication and we think we charge a fair price for it um you know with that with the money we charge for it, and it'll be uh, three pounds fifty tomorrow on the newsstands you know, we can go out and employ our team of experts and, and we can employ our 130 people in the editorial department here. Um, but we're not going to look to increase it at all. Uh, the, the business clearly has taken a, a, a big hit, as so many uh, media industry uh, organisations have and, and many businesses beyond that. Um, but, you know, that's simply the, the product of, of, of the times that we've been mm. through. Um, and thankfully, we've got a robust business. We, we've weathered that storm. And we're looking to kick on now and focus on delivering our readers and racing and punters, you know, the best coverage we possibly can. Every media organisation, as you say, has had to take advantage of the government's retention scheme, the furlough scheme. You'd be no exception. Have you been able to keep all of your staff on? I mean, have you been able to unfurlough all your staff? Uh, yeah, so we furloughed uh, a large number of our team. Um, we furloughed all but 25 of our editorial staff who stayed on to ensure that the digital coverage uh, was kept up to a uh, high standard. Uh, we've now unfurloughed about three quarters or maybe just under three quarters of the staff that we, that we initially furloughed. Um, and the reason that some are still on the furlough is basically because initially we have a, uh, a, d a diminished racing calendar and obviously people aren't taking you know, two week summer holidays as they normally would. Um, so we'll be looking to get more people back on the pitch in the coming weeks as, uh, as we inch back to normality. And from, from your perspective, how long can you withstand racing behind closed doors if you like yeah i don't think it affects us as uh, as, as as badly as it will some other parts of the industry um, we obviously sell a lot of newspapers on course but we're hoping to see a lot of that business transition to people watching from home 
Um, I think the biggest thing for, for both us and the industry is, is that betting shops reopen. Uh, now, obviously, we, we provide uh, betting shop displays to all the Britain and Ireland's betting shops, and uh, the racing industry at large derives a huge chunk of its income tr- from media rights to show live racing in bookmakers. So we're hoping that that gets to go ahead to reopen, which, which could be as soon as uh, June 15, the day before Royal Ascot, um, and that would clearly be a big boost to both us and the industry. Tom, good luck tomorrow. Um, very much looking forward to, to reading it. It's great news that the, that the paper is back. I've asked you on this program before. I asked your predecessor, Bruce Millington, and I'll ask you again. Do you think in 10 years' time the print edition of the Racing Post will still be going strong? It's, it's anyone's guess. I hope so. I really do, and I, and, I, and I believe there's a very strong chance of it. You know, we've seen the difficulty uh, the print media has over the last 10, 20 years. But what we've also seen, and we've, we saw this over the last two months, is that there's a, there's a huge uh, affinity, a huge loyalty, and a huge, uh, you know, a passion that people have for printed newspapers. It's all well and good getting your news online, and, and that's what we, what we all do on a day-to-day basis. But there's a different experience that comes from holding a print newspaper. You, it's, a, it's a more considered way to consume information. You know, we, you're not being beset by the, the myriad uh, distractions of, of, our, of our smartphones and laptops. So, you know, from a personal point of view, I, st- I really hope it is still about in 10 years. Um, and I think there's a very good chance that we will still have a print newspaper then. And, and I can't let you go without reminding everybody that the uh, Racing and Football Outlook and Weekend are going to carry on as normal too. They, they are, they'll both be out next week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and the team working on them are, have already been working for several days now, preparing some bumper editions, first editions back. Great news. Tom, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Nick.